Thank you for joining us online here at Fam Church as we continue our series, Hope, and our lead pastor, Brian Lane. But, uh, this morning, we're continuing our series called Hope. And uh, um, to this morning's thing, I'm not going to say it's a little controversial. It, it might and it might not be because a couple of the things that I say in here might shake a little bit of people, it might shake a couple of people up. And so I just want you to be prepared for that, okay? But uh, we started on this series called Hope, and, and the first week we looked at the life of Lazarus, and we looked at that whole story of Jesus coming to Lazarus and his family when Lazarus was in the grave and how when Jesus got there to, to visit his, his friends, Martha and Mary, how they, they got, he got to the town and, and Lazarus had been sick and now Lazarus was dead and people were frustrated. People were angry with Jesus because he showed up so late. He got there too late and by this time Lazarus had already been dead four days and so they were kind of aggravated. They were kind of upset with Jesus because he didn't make it there on time. And they felt like, well, Jesus really didn't care about them. However, what we saw in that story was Jesus Jesus had something greater in store for the people there. Jesus had something greater in store for Martha and Mary and Lazarus by showing up late. And he showed us a couple of things that give us hope. And the first thing that we saw in there that gives us hope is that God always has a plan. Regardless of what the situation is, regardless of what the circumstance is, God has a plan and he is going to do something. Okay, and then the second thing that we saw is that God still heals today. Uh, there's nothing beyond, no matter what the doctors say, no matter what anybody else says, God still heals today. And in that there is hope. There is hope for our own healing. There is hope for our own issues, our own things that we're going through. And Jesus can and will heal. And so this morning, we are continuing on our journey to Jerusalem with Jesus. His first stop was here at the home of Martha and Mary. And now we are going to look at this morning's events that have come to be known as Palm Sunday. Okay, and to set up what we are going to talk about today, I want you to think about rescuing people. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember this. There's been some events that have happened in the, the near, the, the recent history where people have been trapped, people have been caught, where the news has been there, and people had to have been, had to have been rescued from something. And one of the things that sticks out in my mind big, and it might not here, maybe it's just because we were living in Boston at the time that this happened, but there was this nightclub fire in Rhode Island. I don't know if you guys remember hearing about this or not, but there, there was this nightclub and this band called Great White was playing in there and they had all these pyrotechnics and, and the stage wasn't fireproofed and so they launched these pyrotechnics and pretty soon this whole club started on fire. And people were rushing for the exits to get out. And what happened was there was a bottleneck at the doors. And so they literally had video of people standing at the doors trying to exit the building. There had been so many people trying to get out that door that they literally got wedged and stuck in the door. Nobody could move. And they were showing videos of people with their hands reached out calling for people to come and rescue them from the, pot, the fire that was burning the building down behind them. In that fire, over 200 people died. Or maybe you remember this event from a couple of years ago of the miners in Chile that were trapped underground. There were these miners that were trapped deep within the earth and for 69 days the world waited to see what would happen as these miners were eventually and finally plucked from the belly of the earth and brought back to the surface, rescued from imminent death thousands of feet beneath the ground. Now, maybe it's not that. Maybe there's a more personal rescue story in your life. Maybe you found yourself in a situation where you needed to be rescued. I mean, my brother and I, when we were kids, we found ourselves in this very spot. Um, Dana, Dana loves it when I tell this story. She says I tell it a lot. But it's a good story, so you're going to have to deal with it, all right? So this is the story. My brother and I, my, parent, my grandparents had this home. They had, uh, not a home, it was a cabin in northern Wisconsin on a lake. Okay, and it was in the middle of the woods. It was just in the middle of nowhere. And across the road from this cabin was thousands and thousands of acres of state forest. There were no homes in there. There was none of that stuff. It was just thousands of acres of state forest. And what they had done was the county had come along and they had built these trails. They had built hiking trails. They had built skiing trails. And so yeah, I would go over there because I spent a lot of time at my grand, with my grandparents when I was a kid. I would go up there. I would go with them and I would go over there in the summertime and I would hike the trails or I would go over there in the wintertime and I would ski the trails and I was out in the trails quite a bit. 
So I thought that I was an expert at these trails. I thought I knew the trails, the woods, well enough that I could go out there exploring. So one summer day, one July evening, after we had finished di dinner, my brother and I uh, decided, said, Steve, we're going to go for a walk. And so me and Steve, and we grabbed our dog, and we headed out into this trail. And there was a short loop. It was a half-mile loop. And I said, I'll take my brother on this half-mile loop. It'll be a nice short journey through the woods. So we got out there and we started hiking. And this hike should have taken us about 20 minutes. Well, an hour into this hike, I knew something was wrong. What I did not know about these trails was this. In those thousands of acres of land that the county had, they allowed paper companies to come into the woods and cut down trees. It was kind of a way to, to clear the forest because, you know, every so often floor, forest needs to be cleaned up, otherwise you risk fires. And so they allowed paper companies to come in there and clear the forest out and use the, the trees that they cut down for paper. And the, the, the paper companies cut miles and miles of what they called logging trails through the woods. And so... These logging trails intersected on the hiking trails, and I didn't know that. And so my brother and I were hiking, and we came to a place that was a fork in the road. And this fork over this way was overgrown. It didn't look like anyone had traveled that way. And there was another way right here that was clear, that was well cut, and that was well groomed. And so the assumption that I made was that this was for us to walk down. And so instead of going on the way that wasn't quite as well cut, we headed on the way that was well cut. Well, that was a logging trail. My brother and I got miles out into the woods. Now today, what would you do if you were in that situation? You would pull out your cell phone, you would go to Google Maps, press a button, and let it pinpoint where you were on the map, right? And then you would look at where you were on the map and you would figure your way out. Well, there was a time when this technology did not exist, children, you need to realize this. Okay, there was a time when cell phones didn't even exist. Oh, no way. Yes. When I was a teenager, there were no cell phones. There were no GPS. There was none of this technology. And so we got out there. We're standing in the woods. I knew that we weren't where we were supposed to be. We were lost, and we needed to do something. And so I just started to hike. My brother and I just started hiking and hiking and hiking through the woods. And after three hours of hiking, we finally thought what we saw was our salvation. It was a house. And we thought, okay, here we go, we're going to get out of here. It was getting close to nighttime, it was like 9.30, and up north in the summertime, I mean, the sun stays up pretty late. And so we get to this house, and we start pounding on the door, but there's no one home. So we think to ourselves, dang. And so we go, and we start hiking again. We hiked for another three and a half hours before we finally found another house. A total of six and a half hours of hiking. So we get to this house, and there were people home. There were cars in the driveway. By this time, it was 1 o'clock in the morning, so everybody was asleep. This did not deter us. We got to the door. We pounded on the door. They had a dog in there that was barking. We did everything we could to make that dog bark louder. For 20 minutes, we banged and made noise and messed with their dog so that they would wake up and come and open the door. We were desperate. We were ready to be rescued. We were sick of hiking through the woods, and we did whatever we could to get out of the situation that we were in. And so this morning, the text that I want to look at is Matthew chapter 21, verses 6 through 11. And what I want you to do, I want you to keep that idea in your mind. I want you to keep that idea in your head. I want you to keep that picture of somebody desperately trying to get saved from something as we read this text. And so here's what it says. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, how I've been traditionally told this event took place was this was a very exciting time. 
Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. He was walking into the city, and as he was entering into the city, people were excited. They were happy. They were singing. They were dancing. They were with palm trees just out there. Ah. You know, I don't know if you guys remember the song from the 1980s, a worship song called Hosanna in the Highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. I don't try and sing, okay? That's just not my gift. Okay, but that song, I'm picturing in my head everybody dancing around with palm trees, singing this song, going, yay, Jesus is here. Hosanna in the highest. It was a party. It was a celebration. That brings back another 80s song right there. Celebration. You guys know that's a, sorry. The 80s were the greatest musical decade ever. If you did not live in the 80s, I'm sorry for you. But anyways, this is the picture. This is the picture. It's a time of great rejoicing. And, and, you know, that's the kind of thing that I've been led to believe. But I don't really think this is how this entirely went down right here. I don't think this is entirely how this took place. And why do I think that? Because of the conditions of the city of Jerusalem and the Jews in about 33 A.D. when this took place in Jerusalem. And so we're going to wind back in history for a, for a little bit. And we're going to go back to the Romans conquering of Jerusalem. And the Romans, under the command of General Pompey, came into Jerusalem in 63 BC and they invaded the city and they took it over. Okay, when they invaded the city, they of course removed the Jewish rulers that were in place and they took them out and they put their own ruler in place of the Jews who had been ruling. They deconstructed a system of government that had been there for hundreds of years. And, and they put this guy in place named Antipater. Now, who he is, is uh, he's Herod the Great's father. If you remember from the story of Jesus' birth back in the beginning of Matthew, Herod the Great was the guy who sent, who sent the military down to Bethlehem to kill all of the boys two years old and younger when the, when the wise men didn't come back to tell him where Jesus was at. Okay? This is Herod the Great. This is Herod the Great's father. Okay? He was in charge. Uh, that's who the Romans put in charge. And under Antipater's reign, the new Roman government chased and killed all Jewish resistance groups. Okay? It was a bloody and violent time for the Jewish people. Through a series of events, rebellions, and battles with foreign troops that came to the aid of the Jews, Herod and the Roman government took firm control of the area about 33 B.C. And it was ruled with an iron fist. People who the Romans or Herod thought were going to rebel against their structure and system of government were arrested and crucified. Okay, there was very little option for negotiation or prison. They just took people and they killed them. They wanted people to know that they were large, they were in charge, and no one was messing with them. It was a dictatorship. It was a brutal dictatorship. And by the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Jews had been living under almost 60 years of this oppressive government system. The Jews were done. The Jews wanted to be free. They wanted to be done with the oppression that they were under. And the second thing that I want to show you in this text to help us understand these verses is the word that they say. Hosanna. You know, this word has come to be a word of praise. But when you look at the literal translation of this word Hosanna, it means save. And in the Greek text here, this word is in the imperative. When it's in the imperative, it's an exclamation point. It means that the people are shouting. It means that the people are saying this, Save us! Save us! It wasn't a celebration when he came into the city of Jerusalem the way that we think of it, but he was coming into the city in like the Rhode Island nightclub where people are reaching out and they're screaming, save us, pull us out of the fire. He was thinking in the same way that the Chilean miners were down in the earth and saying, save us, pull us from out of the earth. He's thinking in the same way that my brother and I, when we were knocking on the door of this house in the middle of the night, were telling them to save us, to open the door and let us in so that we could be rescued. See, they were looking for freedom. They were hoping that Jesus was going to bring them freedom. They were yelling at Jesus, Hosanna, save us, save us. But what kind of salvation were they looking for? Well, it says right there in the first line, uh, Hosanna to the son of David. They were looking for the son of David to come and save them. And uh, you may be saying to yourself, well, who is that? What does that mean, the son of David? Well, David was a dude in the Old Testament, okay? And uh, he lived, he is the guy that kind of unified the 12 tribes of Israel 
under one king. And he was able to establish Israel as a political and military power in the area. He built an army. He was able to defeat Israel's enemies that had been oppressing them and attacking them for decades. And uh, not only did he bring political unity, but he also brought unity to the nation's worship of God. See, for a long time, as Israel had operated as 12 separate tribes, they had issues and problems with people worshiping other gods, with other gods coming in there, and the Israelites worshiping them, and, and they suffered as a result of these worship, of, these, of getting off track in their worship. And David, when he came in to, and became the leader of the nation, he brought all of that together. David fixed the worship and got them all worshiping Yahweh under, under the, the temple, well, at the, the tabernacle in Jerusalem. And uh, how he accomplished this, though, was through his ability to lead, but more importantly, through his political and military strength. Yes, God was with him. Yes, God led him as he did this. But the government structure was what supported and sustained the system. And so back to our events, this is what the people thought Jesus was going to do. He was going to come in. He was going to be like David. The people were looking at Jesus thinking that he's going to be the one to come in as their political and as their religious hero and save the day. He's going to be the one that saves them from Rome and the oppression that they are under. The Jews, they thought that Jesus was going to be their political savior. They thought that Jesus was going to rise to power as their king, rally an army around him, and through the supernatural power of God, restore the nation of Israel and return it to its political power by defeating and throwing out the Romans. That was the way the Jews thought they were going to be free, was through political change. And here's the thing. Many people in the church today believe the exact same thing. Not just inside the church, though, outside the church, too. We look to our elected to officials to get freedom from them. We feel that if the right power party is in power in the White House or in the Senate or in the House, then suddenly we're going to be able to find freedom that way. That if the right person is elected, elected everything's going to be great. And this plays out in election after election that we have here. I remember when George W. Bush was elected president. I remember people screaming, hallelujah, the darkness has been lifted of the Clinton years. And now we have the glorious light of George W. Bush in the White House. And then what happened eight years later? The exact same thing was said. Hallelujah, George Bush is gone. The darkness has been lifted and Barack Obama is here. And we have a new light in the White House and everything is going to be wonderful. But how much has changed? Nothing. Nothing really has changed at all. Our country is no closer to its salvation than it was eight years ago, 16 years ago, or 24 years ago. See, the reason that we are never going to find an answer to the things we are looking for is, um, is because we are looking through politics. See, it doesn't matter if we're a Democrat. It doesn't matter if we're a Republican, a Libertarian, an Independent, a, a Socialist, whatever political party we ally ourselves with, that political party and politics is never going to save anyone from the deepest cry in their heart to be free. Because politics can never give us the ultimate freedom that we are looking for or that we need. People think that they can be free to be, if they are free to be who they want to be, if they are free to be themselves, then everything will be different. That if the government helps them to live how it is that they want to live, then suddenly freedom is going to come to their life. But what some forget and what some don't know is the only thing that will bring us true freedom is when we are free from our sin. And nobody can do that for us in any government anywhere in the world. This was missed by the Jews back then, and many times in the church today, we miss this exact same thing as well. And something else the Jews missed back then is that they were looking for a person to be their savior, when all along it was God who wanted to be their savior. See, we have a God who sits up there who has all the power and resources available to him. And yet we continually look to a person to bring us that salvation and that hope. 
Think about it. I mean, somebody with such finite limitations like a person like me or like you, and we have God at our disposal, and yet we don't look at it. I mean, think about this. Uh, Isaiah 40, 12, it says this. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who, knows the way, who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? God holds the oceans in his hand. Think how much water you can get in your hand. Okay? That's the oceans for God. He could stretch out his fingers like this, and he has stretched his hand across the universe. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty incredible. And God is saying that's who we should turn to when it comes to getting salvation in this world. Turn to God. Don't turn to people. And really, God has given us the solution to the political problems that we face in the first place. This is what it says in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their lands. If my people... If you're a follower of Jesus, this verse is for you. If you follow Jesus, Jesus is saying, right, or God is saying right here in this verse, we, my people, listen to this. Is he saying, listen, my people, if you will turn to the Democratic or the Republican Party and ask them to fix the problem, I will take care of it? No, that's not what he's saying there. He's saying, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then... I will heal your land. We look to the wrong place. We look to the wrong people. We look to everything else to heal our land. And God is saying our hope in saving our country is not through getting the right people in office. Now, I am not up here saying that we should not vote. And it doesn't matter if you vote. We need to vote. We need to vote wisely. But that is not our solution. That is not our hope. That is not our salvation as followers of Jesus. Our hope for our country is in us humbling ourselves. Us praying. Us seeking God. And as we do that, God will heal our land. So if you look at our nation and you're saying we need to be saved, don't look at who to elect. The solution is how we pray. We should be praying, God, heal this nation. God, heal this land. God is the hope of this nation as long as we are followers of Jesus, as long as we are committed to praying and asking God to come and to heal our land, He will do it. He said, then I will. Okay, He doesn't say, then I might. Then if I feel like it, He says, then I will come and heal your land. He was the only hope for the Jews back then, and He's the only hope we have now. Let's ask God to heal our land, and that's where we can get hope in this country. The second things, thing that the Jews were looking for was a religious Savior. They wanted the political king to come and revive their religion as well. They thought that this king would come and establish himself as the high priest and bring the country back in to the strictest following of the Jewish law. And if you don't know what the Jewish law is, if you open a Bible and there's those first five books in there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those are the law. And uh, many conservative religious leaders at the time felt like the reason the Romans were there in the first place was because the nation had gotten too far away from following God's law. So God was mad at them because of how lax they had become. And so he allowed the Romans in the land to show them what the story was. And they felt like God was telling them to get it together religiously. And until they got it together religiously, this was going to be their fate. He was going to let them suffer. So they were counting on a religious savior who would make the people follow the law. See, the nation was also hoping to get more religious. And the thing is, let's talk about this whole idea of religion for a minute. What is religion? See, religion is a system where people perform tasks to please a God who gets angry at them when we don't perform those tasks. 
And so in order to make this God happy, we work harder and we do more to perform those tasks and follow every rule and regulation that we can follow. We look through the scriptures, we find stuff that we can add to a list and say, these are the things that I do, this is what makes me a follower of God's. And what we do is we look at our life, and if our life doesn't go in the direction that we think it should, if our life is kind of messed up, if it's not going the way that we think it should, we think the problem is, is because we haven't followed the rules good enough. We haven't done what we were supposed to do good enough. And because we haven't done what we are supposed to do good enough, God is punishing us. And so we just got to get deeper. We got to dig deeper. We got to dig our heels in more and work harder and be better and, and do the godly thing more and more and more. And so many people think that that's what following Jesus is about. It's about digging in, having a list. You know, I've got this list right here. And on this list are all the things that I do. And on this side are all the things that I don't do. And that's proof that I follow God. We get caught in a religious trap. We become religious people. We base our relationship with God on the things that we do and don't do. And then we go and we judge other followers of Jesus based on how well they follow this list that we've made up. Our life becomes a ritual of things that we do because if we don't do them, God's going to get mad at us. And if God gets mad at us, then we've got to do extra work and put in extra time to make God happy again. And when he's mad, that's when we get zapped. That's when somebody gets sick. That's when we get into hard times. That's when we have all kinds of suffering in our lives. He's a cruel, harsh taskmaster. But I want you to think about this. If you had somebody living next door, whatever, who was a parent, and you knew that this is how they were treating their kids, what would you think of them as a parent? You would think they were a horrible parent. Somebody would probably even call DCF saying, man, this, this person, as long as their kid is good, treats them good. But when their kid starts to mess up, treats them like junk, man. They, it locks them in bathrooms, whatever, you know. And, and, and we, we, we would do something about it. But yet we paint this very picture of who God is in our own lives and in our own minds. And then we say to ourselves, why doesn't anyone want to have anything to do with Jesus? Well, the reason is, is because we paint this picture of Jesus as this dude standing up in the sky waiting for us to mess up and break some sort of rule that he's got so that he can hit us hard, so that he can zap us, and so that he can take us down. But that's not what it means to follow Jesus. Do you know that Jesus disliked the religious leaders when he was alive? He called them all kinds of names. He called them a brood of vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs. He called them people who put burdens on people's lives that are so heavy they are unable to carry them. He called them sons of their father, Satan. Jesus was against religion and blasted at every chance he got because religion looks at me and says, what can I do to get right with God? But you know what God says? There's nothing you can do to get right with me. Nothing can make you worthy of my presence. Nothing you do can make you worthy of standing before my throne. What makes you worthy is Jesus and nothing else. Now this doesn't mean we do not have to do stuff within our ability to live the life that God has called us to live. But what it does mean is that when we do miss the mark, when we do mess up, God doesn't come and say, okay, sorry, one shot, you're out, eh, next. You know, he doesn't throw us out of the family. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't, you know, just get rid of us. Instead, he, we have a God of love. We have a God of mercy. We have a God of grace, a God of forgiveness that we can go to when we do miss the mark. And he gives us that love and that mercy and that grace and that forgiveness. He forgives us and he continues to walk with us. He doesn't strike us with blindness because we miss church. He doesn't cause us to lose our jobs because we messed up earlier in the week. So the Jews were looking for a savior that would make them conform to a list of do's and don'ts so they could be more religious thinking that would save them. That would get them out of the place that they were at as a nation. But Jesus was given the opposite message. He was saying... There is no hope in religion 
Being more religious isn't going to save you. Being more religious only leads to more chains. Being religious only leads to more fear. Being religious only leads to more hopelessness in our lives. Being religious does not bring hope, life, peace, joy, or anything. And Jesus is the opposite of religion. Jesus leads to hope. Jesus frees us from the chains of religion. Jesus sets us free from all of those things. With Jesus, we no longer have to try harder to get in a better place with God. It's not about us taking a list and conforming to it anymore. It's about us entering into a relationship with Him. And through that, we are worthy to stand in God's presence. And there's no other way. There's nothing else that we can do. And so don't sit there and try and get a hold of a list and say, God, I'm doing this list to the best of my ability. He doesn't want to see your list. He wants to see you before him saying, God, I am not worthy. God, come in and set me free from this chains of religion that have a hold of my life. Because only I can give hope. You can't get hope in following a list. And so, Rob, if you want to come back up, the question becomes, what does all of this mean to us? What do these two things mean to us? Well, the first one is, if you've been struggling, politics got you going crazy, that's not going to save those in our nation that are screaming, save us. It's not going to change anyone's life. See, we live in a nation where the majority of the people in this country are reaching their hands out and are screaming, save us. They know that they're desperately lost and they need something. They need hope. They need something else besides what they are getting, but they don't know what it is. And they're turning to politics. And a lot of the time, we in the church think that the pol politics is going to help us. But it's not. Politics is good. Having good people in power is good. But we need to turn to the living God and we need to say, God, you know what? It doesn't matter who sits in the White House. It doesn't matter who is leading this country. I need to get on my knees and I need to pray and I need to say, God, Heal this land. God, do something in this land to bring healing and hope to this place. And when we do that, Jesus is going to meet us. Jesus is going to come and heal this land. That's how people will be transformed. That's how people will be changed. He's calling us to trust in Him, not trust in any person, in any place of authority, and to pray. For others this morning, maybe you've been caught up in this religious trap. You beat yourself up every single day because you can't measure up to the standards that you see in the Bible and you're saying to yourself, God, I can't do this. God, if you're real, why don't you help me? God, help me to follow this list. God is saying to you this morning to take that list, set it on fire, get it out of your hands, and to come into his presence and to say, God, I'm not worthy. There's nothing I can do to be worthy. God, make me worthy. And when we do that, Jesus will come and he will set you free from the chains and the hold that religion has on you. And he will allow you to walk in the freedom of his spirit, of his power and his life. He'll take that burden that you're trying to carry. He'll take those chains that you're trying to carry in your life. He'll pull them off of you and he'll set you free. And nothing can give hope more than Jesus coming and lifting the burden of religion off of our lives.